turn with me, if you will, to the book of Luke this morning. The book of Luke, chapter 11, if you have your Bible with. And as always, we'll display scriptures and points on the wall behind me. And uh, we're going to look at a very famous passage of scripture this morning in the gospel of Luke. And uh, starting in uh, Luke 11 and verse 1, uh, and it's, it's here that the disciples, or at least, at least one of the disciples, asked the Lord while he was praying, it must have looked pretty enticing, it must have looked pretty good, because they looked at him, they liked so much what they were seeing, and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. T- tell me how to pray. And so, okay, Luke 11, 1, it says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the, his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, all right, when you pray, say this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, Your kingdom come, your will be done. And this is the line that we're going to kind of focus on today, just for a few minutes, uh, on heaven as it is in earth. I want us to highlight that line, that one phrase, on heaven as it is in earth. Certainly, these words by Jesus serve to link time and space. Do you get that? They link time and space on earth as it is in heaven, earth as it is in heaven. So I'm continuing on in Luke. Give us day by day our daily bread. I'm slightly paraphrasing. I might look different behind me here. (laughs) Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, Go with me to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, and uh, chapter 21. Chapter 21. I was just preaching from this chapter yesterday as I had the honor of officiating at uh, the funeral for Jane Murray, very sweet lady, saint of God, who was part of our congregation, and she has gone on to be with the Lord. And, uh, and my thoughts were taken right to what... Her life is like now. So we're sad. You know, we're in this building and we're sad. We've lost somebody. What's she like right now? And where's she at? So Revelation 21. Okay, here we go. All right, strap in. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth, that's where we're at right now, had passed away. Also, There was no more sea. Then I, John, the writer of this, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling, the tent of God, the the temple of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. We just sang it. No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain. No more pain, for the former things have passed away. Somebody please say amen. Amen. Come on. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. All things new. And he said to me, Write these words that are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Freely to him who thirsts. 
He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Just used generically, son, daughter, he will be my son. But cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I think it should be noted right here that this verse does not mean that, uh, for instance, that if you lied, you're going to hell. Now it means if you lied, but you didn't trust Jesus to pay the penalty for your lies, you will have to pay the price. But if you lied, in fact, if you lied 100,000 times, but you put your faith in Jesus to pay the penalty for your lies and those other sins, you're going to spend eternity with him. Come on, somebody. Let's get a bit excited this morning about the, the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? All right, continuing on verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven balls filled, bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, and clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels with the gates, and the names written on them were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city's laid out as a square. Its length is as great as, as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, height are equal, like a square. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. The construction of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, then chalcedony, then emerald, then sardonyx, then sardius, then chrysolite then beryl, then topaz, then chrysosphase, then jacinth, then amethyst, 12 stones. Verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it. If you were Jewish, you would expect to see a temple. You'd be looking first for a temple. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by, 
But there shall by means enter, no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wow. Revelation 21. I mean, what an amazing stuff, isn't it? Some of you just completed your entire personal Bible reading requirement for the whole week. Congratulations. And all the teenagers said, hallelujah, right? <laughs> now, Pastor Kurt just finished a great series last week on kingdom living. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to just try to do it justice because that was an awesome series. So for a little while today, we're going we're gonna to talk about kingdom come. Kingdom come. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you. Lord, we take a deep breath after reading all of this in Revelation 21 of, of what heaven will be like and what's coming, oh God, and what is. Father, I thank you. Lord, I pray that you would pour your anointing out on all of us today like an oil, oh God. Lord, that our minds would be open, our hearts would be open to receive from you today that which you have for us. We give you all the glory for today's service in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, if people think about you, how would they identify you? I mean, is there one word, two words, three words? How, you know, what, what, what do you think you'd be associated with? What are, what are you known as? I know because I struggle with this. I really do. I struggle a bit with this. Because, because sometimes I'm pastor guy. In the, this morning, I guess. I'm pastor guy. Yesterday, I was pastor guy. So, but it's not a full-time job. It's just a full-time habit, you know? It's just, it's... <laughs> It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a full-time focus, but not a full-time job. There's other full-time jobs. So I'm known as other stuff. You know, that's a problem. So sometimes I'm known as racquetball guy, and certainly not because I'm any good, okay? <laughs> it has to do with the fact that I run leagues and I organize stuff. Imagine that. Gary organizes stuff. So I'm racquetball guy. When I'm around the club, I have people walk up and say, hey, you're the racquetball guy, right? I'm like, I guess. Yeah, yeah. What question do you have, right? You know, sometimes I'm real estate guy. Sometimes I'm pastor guy and real estate guy on the same day. <laughs> you know, it's hard to switch real quick. You know, it's like, who am I now? What am I now? Sometimes, sometimes I'm even, even software guy, you know, so work for a software company too. So many jobs, so little time, <laughs> you know. And then I wonder a little bit about just Christians in general. How should Christians be identified? How should they be identified? I mean, just in general, you know, how, what, what do you think people think of when they think of, you know, you say, you know, I'm, I'm Christian guy, I'm, I'm a Christian. What, what thoughts does that evoke, you know? So suggestion, how about, Kingdom people. How about that? Maybe I, could be, maybe I could be kingdom guy, you know? Put all the other ones aside and just be kingdom guy. There's a guy that I work with at, uh, at my software company, and I don't know how he did it. I, I, it's, I guess I know how he did it. So, so he's, a, he's a weightlifter. He's a real uh, healthy guy, what he eats and when he works out and all this. I mean, he's... He's over the top. He's in good shape. Um, you know, pretty big guy. And, uh, and it's funny, over time, he has become known as Big Iron Guy. <laughs> big Iron Guy. I'd like to be Big Iron Guy. I don't think I'm going to get there in this lifetime. You know, Big Iron Guy. So forget that. I want to be Kingdom Guy. I think that trumps Big Iron Guy. That's, that's my thought, you know. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, that kind of that sums up who we are pretty well, doesn't it? His will be done. He is a king. He has a kingdom. Heaven is invading earth. Kingdom come. Kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Jesus said, when you pray, I want you to align your desires with bringing heaven to earth. I want you to live like you're living in heaven or live like it is heaven. You know, that's a, that's a big statement for us mortal people. We're mortal people. I mean, Jesus says, hey, when you pray, when you pray, start like this. I want you to say, our heavenly Father, Father, our Father who art in heaven, he says, when you come to God first, I want you to, to hallow him to praise him and, and acknowledge where he is, our Father who art in heaven. Then I want you to ask him, by his grace, to leak a little bit of heaven through us into this place. I want you to live as if you're in heaven. So then, the million-dollar question is, it must be, what is heaven like? What's heaven like? I mean, for most of us, heaven is no more than, a, than an old Huggies commercial with a chubby baby in underwear plucking harps on fluffy clouds, right? That's the, that's the picture that Hollywood painted for us of heaven. Thank you so much, you know? I mean, come on, somebody, let's be honest here. Heaven is a little bit abstract. It's a, little bit abs it's a little bit random for us. Some of us are like, heaven, yeah, heaven's going to be awesome. That's all I know. <laughs> you know it's, I just know it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. Has anybody ever heard an old school preacher say something like, I, I mean, especially to, like, like to the young people when we used to go to Rush River Bible Camp, and an old school preacher get up and, and say, hey, if you don't like this three-hour service, you're not going to like heaven much. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and the young people, the young people are all like, so how bad is hell again? <laughs> you know? Is there a chance that there's like any air conditioning there at all? Because you know what? This, this, this never-ending church service is not really going to work for me. You know, but what, what is heaven like, church? What's it, what's it like? I'll tell you what, Revelation 21 that we read in its entirety and Revelation 22 give us in the entire Bible the clearest description of what, the, what heaven is like. The very clear, the best that we've got is in Revelation 21 and 22. It's all there. Now, what is explained in Revelation 21 and 22, just for context here, uh, you, you scholars, you Bible scholars, it's specifically describing the post-resurrection in the new age. Scholars call it the new heavens and the new earth. That's what's being described there. But, you know, you know what we find, and can I say this? Heaven, it seems to me, is more earthly than any of us realize. I mean, look at Jesus. Jesus, when he was resurrected in his glorified body, his, his body is a prototype, right? We're going to get glorified bodies. His body is a prototype. And they recognized him physically. They recognized him. He was the same, but he was different. He was different, but he was the same and by the way, he ate food. Matter of fact, read it close. In the end of John, he even had some dessert. You know? So there's that. I mean, come on. There's going, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth at the end of the age, okay? Heaven is going to meet earth. Earth is going to meet heaven. And God is going to fill it forever and ever and ever, and we will inhabit that planet, and it will be perfect. It will be redeemed, for the Bible says that even creation, creation groans for its redemption. That's what the Bible tells us. I mean, we just had another Earth Day. Yippee. 
I mean, let me say it again. The earth is not your mother, but I will concede what the Bible says, that all of creation is groaning for its redemption, groaning for its redemption. You know, there's people that worship the earth that they're just, they're just out of place. If they came to know Jesus, they would understand that the pain that they're identifying is the earth groaning for its redemption from God. That's what's happening, right? Now, what John describes is probably indescribable. But notice that God, from the throne, tells John this. He says, write it down. Write it down. In other words, I want my children to read this. Write it down. Now listen, this, this is heaven described for us in a moment. And, and there, is, there is a literal city. It's called New Jerusalem. We're actually going to live in a city. And by the way, the, the city has streets. So why would there be streets if all we're going to do is just float around a bit, you know? So, yeah, some of you love your cars, right, Pastor Benson? <laughs> you know? And, and you, think, you think we're going to go to heaven and just float around? You know, what a drag. <laughs> you know, why are there streets then? I, I think there must be at least a 56 Chevy or two there, right? There must be. Is that, a safe, is that a safe guess? I don't know. Now, the extraordinary thing is that this city is made up of treasures from this world, from this context that we're in. Precious jewels. I mean, they're so exotic, I could barely pronounce them. Some of them, I, I don't know if I've ever seen them. I don't even know what they are. But, you know, jasper and gold and the like. And it says that the whole city is as clear as glass. It says that the street, which is gold, but you've never seen gold like this. It's, it's clear. It's gold, but it's transparent. And it goes on in Revelation 21. It says that in Revelation 22, 1, it says that there's a river that comes from the throne, and it's also transparent. I've never seen a transparent river. Revelation 4, 6 says that there's a sea, and the sea is like glass. It's like glass. I mean, what's going on with that? While we're on the topic, what is the point of all these treasures and these jewels and these precious metals? You know, I wonder if we could all hear those things talking. I wonder if they're preaching a sermon to us. I wonder, I wonder if they're speaking to us, if, if we would pay attention. It's as, it's as if gold is telling us that in eternity, the things that you thought were so costly and so important, so much of a treasure here on earth, are not really a treasure. You know, because there is a true treasure. That, that treasure is magnificent, and it's radiant, and it's brilliant, and it's indescribable, and it renders jasper to drywall. I mean, it renders gold to pavement. It renders precious jewels to concrete. There is a true treasure. I mean, it's, it's as if gold realizes that in God's presence, it's not about me anymore. You know? It, it's not about my brilliance. It's not about my glory. You know? I, I'm but a means to the true treasure. I'm a facilitator. That's all I am. And I think that the reason, get this, that the city that we will live in is clear and transparent. I was sharing this yesterday. And the streets are clear and transparent. And the rivers that we will swim in are clear as glass. And the seas that we will see are also clear as glass is because their job is to reflect the glory of God. The glory of God. He is the true treasure. 
It's all about him. It's always been all about him. And then I think John continues in this portion of Scripture in Revelation 22, 4 with fear and trepidation because he's a, he's a Jewish man. He's a Christian, but he grew up Jewish. He understands the ramifications of what he's about to say. If you know the biblical narrative, you understand that what he's about to say is absolutely unheard of because he writes... And they need a breath. They shall see his face. They shall see his face. I mean, it's, it's a catastrophic to make a statement that all mankind will behold their creator in all of his brilliance and his beauty and his majesty. And John says, there in eternity, we will see his face. I mean, Moses, Moses, back in the Old Testament, all he saw was, was his, his backside passing by, and he glowed like a glow stick at, at, a, you know, at skate night at the roller rink. You know? All he saw was a passing shadow. When we see his face, folks, we're going to wonder. I believe this. We're going to wonder if we ever truly lived before. We're going to wonder if we ever truly lived before. I said this at the funeral because it's, it's something that I believe. I said this a lot of times that, you know, when someone passes, we here on earth, we comfort ourselves by saying, well, I know, I know grandma is looking over us. You know, I know dad is watching us right now, and he's, he's proud of what we're doing. I know, that, I know that, that grandpa's praying for us and all that. It's a nice thought. It really is. It's a very sweet thought. But you know what? When they see the face of God, I think you're a distant memory. <laughs> I'm not sure that they're looking over the precipice of the kingdom to see what you're up to when instead they could be looking at the face of almighty God. You know, all the other joys and pleasures in eternity will be measured by the pleasure and the pure thrill of just looking upon his face, looking on his face. So take all, think of this, take all of the exhilaration beyond explanation, physical, emotional, mental euphoria that you've had all the experiences that you've had on this planet and multiply that times 100 million and it won't even begin to scratch the surface of what will pulsate through your glorified head down to your glorified feet when you lay eyes on almighty God. You will see his face. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he connects the idea of, of treasure in this life with the treasure in the next life. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says, do not, do not store up for yourselves treasures here on earth. Don't store them up. And he uses three completely bombastic metaphors. He says, where moth and rust and robbers can come in and take it. And then he says, but do, do lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where no moth, no rust, no robbers can come and take it. So he begins to help us define treasure in the light of heaven. And then he makes a statement. Sometimes I think I, we miss this. I think, I think it's one of the primary meanings. He says, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. That's where your heart will be. 
He's trying to turn our heart, our mind, our emotions, our will to eternity. Friends, this, this life is but for a moment. It's, every, it's all we got now, so we think it's everything. But it's but for a moment. It's a breath. It's a whisper. It's a, it's a, it's a vapor. But while I'm passing through this life, while I'm just stopping by, you know, whatever happens this side of heaven, I'm going to be all right. Because there will come a day when I will stand with him and I will see his face and it will be forever, forever. So even if my situation doesn't change, even if things don't work out, even if I don't get the breakthrough I'm praying for or expecting, I will continue in faith. Continue in faith. We need to continue to believe. We need to, we need to continue to contend while we're here, but we have to hold on to the hope of heaven. So then Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, first, and his righteousness. And then he adds a little caveat on the end. He says, oh, by the way, I, I give you all that stuff. You know, that's easy for me. I give you all that stuff. You want pavement? I can give you pavement. You, you, you need drywall? You need treasure? You need gold? I can give you that, but, but just seek me. Just seek me. Notice it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. Not your righteousness. His righteousness. Matthew 5, 20, Jesus said, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So what was so wrong with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? You know, the problem is it was their righteousness. It was theirs. Based on them, it was theirs. My life no longer is connected to my righteousness. I no longer live in a kingdom dependent on my righteousness because his righteousness is now my righteousness. And my focus is the gift that he granted to me by faith. For he who knew no sin, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So let me ask, when God sees you, who does he see? Who does he see? I'll answer for you. He sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees Jesus. I am so thankful that, that my father sees Jesus when he looks at me and he doesn't just see me standing there in my self-righteousness and my filthy rags. I'm so glad. I don't want to stand before a glorious God in my nasty, filthy rags. Now, Romans 13 tells us, instead, clothe yourselves. Clothe yourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered where Galatians, Galatians 5, it teaches what many people call the fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. They're actually not called the fruits of the Spirit. Did you know that? There's no plural in that scripture. None at all. The only plural is on the word works. That's plural. Works are plural because works are excessive. Works are exhausting. But fruit, fruit is singular. You know, scholars, people a lot smarter than me, 
believe that fruit can be summed up in one word. That word is love. It's love. It's as if there's one fruit with nine great flavors, right? But the same fruit. It's not called the fruit of discipline. It's not called the fruit of devotion. Even though discipline and devotion, probably good things, that's not what the fruit of the Spirit is, you know? The greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the fruit of the Spirit, it's not ultimately up to you. Fruit is singular, as if to say there is one fruit, one source, one focus. And you don't focus on the fruit to get fruit. You don't grow fruit by looking at fruit. You focus on Jesus and you get all nine. You get all the fruit. Come on, church. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He said, come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will bring you rest. I'm, I'm your one-stop shop. What do you need? I've got it. I'm already what you need when you need it most. Jesus is everything I need. Don't, don't focus on doing things to impress God. You can't impress God. Focus your attention and your passion on Jesus. In Him is everything that I need pertaining to this life in Jesus. All of that pertaining to life and godliness, it's all found in Jesus. If I just focus on Him, we're going to be all right. And come on, somebody, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. We're all going to be all right, you know? When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, then that's what it is like. In heaven, in heaven, we will see our Savior and we won't be able to take our eyes off of him. Just have eyes and focus for Jesus because you know what? Jesus is everything we need. Will you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. Just for, because it's easier to concentrate and, uh, and easier for the Lord to speak to you when you're concentrating, just bow your heads, close your eyes, just take a good deep breath, breathe in what God is giving to us today and, uh, and the Spirit of God the movement of Christ in this building, in this place. Hallelujah. You know, there might be somebody here today in the building, or there might be somebody joining us online, because we do get a lot of people that, that watch our messages online and join us live online. Uh, and that you might be watching, and you might not be sure we're talking about all this stuff. You might not be sure about your status in God. You, you, you know, we were, we were talking about, about taking on Christ and being forgiven. You're not, you're not sure that you're there yet. You, you don't know that. And you know what? Your ticket into God's kingdom, your ticket's already been paid for. It was paid by the spotless blood of Jesus. That ticket was paid for. Your way has been paid and your reservation is confirmed. You just need to act on that. You need to act on Christ's invitation, his free invitation, and make him the Lord of your whole life. For real, turn away from everything and make him the Lord of your life and determine to follow him all of your days and to press into him. All you need to do, just, you can pray on your own. Just. Pray a sincere prayer on your own. Pray something like this. Pray, Lord, I, I, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent. I turn away from my sins, those things that take me down so easily. I turn from them right now. And I purpose to turn away 
from my old way of living. And Lord, right now, I give you my life, everything that's left. I give you all of my days from here forward, oh God. And I want to learn, as a preacher was saying, I want to learn how to glorify your name. I want you to reflect through me. I want to be known by you, oh God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. You know what? If you pray something like that today and you truly give your heart to Jesus, let me challenge you a couple of different ways. Tell somebody. So Christianity is not meant to be lived in the dark. It's not meant to be lived on an island. It's not meant to be lived by yourself. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be lived out loud, as they say. Tell somebody, you know what? I, I had an experience with God. God came. I think God changed my life, and I have given my life to Jesus. What do you think about that? Just tell them. More than that, you need a place to be discipled. You need people that love you. Because the Bible says in the Old Testament that grapes, we're all grapes in God's kingdom. Grapes are found in the cluster. They're not individual grapes sitting on the ground somewhere by themselves. Those dry up. Grapes are found in the cluster. Find a church. Find a church like Stonebridge. Find this church. If you need a church, this is a great church. Find a church. Find a pastor that will love you and pray for you and be involved in your life and will disciple you and leaders who will care about you and will live life with you and will disciple you. So that's what you need. That's what you need. Hallelujah. And you know what? For everyone else, let's just pray. Let's just pray. Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. God, I, I, I sincerely pray this morning. Thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, I, I feel like so often I just take so much for granted. Lord, I, I feel like, like so often, Lord, I, I, I'm not walking around with a grateful heart or I forget to say words of gratefulness, God, but you have done so much for us. Lord, starting with redeeming us, giving your life for us, Lord, changing our lives. But Lord, there's so much. And we just thank you for that, God. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for washing us clean. Thank you for giving us a future and a hope. Jesus, help me to reflect your glory and your goodness to people all around me here on this earth while I'm living this life, oh God. I pray that when people see us, Lord, that they will recognize something that they can't even explain. Thank you for that, God. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done. Help us to begin to live on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus, like, like all creation, we long to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We love you, Lord. And we long for your kingdom to come. Thank you for all this. Lord, bless the rest of our day. Lord, touch those who need to be touched this morning. Lord, those that are in need of a healing, and I know there are many, pour out your power and your healing, your grace. Lord, that you would restore their bodies, make it like new, O oh God. We thank you, you are a miracle-working God, and we thank you for that this morning. We trust you, and we do bring those requests to you. Lord, anybody struggling with a difficulty in this life, God, I pray that you would just bless them, strengthen them, speak to them. Lord, lift their load. Lord, let them live, oh God, as, as someone who is carrying a light burden, a light burden, that the, the yoke is not heavy. Oh, God, and I thank you for this. Lord, bless the rest of our week. Jesus, I pray that every one of us in this building by tomorrow morning will find somebody to share the good word of God with and to share a testimony with. We thank you for this, Lord. We just give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you, everybody. Glad to see you out in God's house. And uh, we'll see you tonight for... 
for open house prayer, and we'll see you back here again. God bless you.